Hello everyone, welcome into CMS Connected here on The Pulse Network. This is the web content management industry's only news commentary show. Glad you could join us today. I am your host, Tyler Piper, and we've got a very special show for you guys today. Really just laid out, we're going to be taking an in-depth look at where SharePoint 2010 aligns in the marketplace from a WCM management perspective. You know, what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses, how does it stack up with the other WCM.net solutions, all that, those questions and more. Now, of course, you saw him in the beginning. I didn't introduce him yet, but of course I have to introduce him. Right now, we welcome in Scott Lewer, always the co-host. Scott, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. Thanks. I'm excited about this show. It's a really well, I was going to say, we've got a, a pretty interesting show for sure, without question. We, we do. You know, I think SharePoint is always the 800-pound gorilla, uh, you know, and <laughs> so uh, it's good. Let's talk about it head on. It's uh, good, bad, and the ugly, right? Exactly, without question. So that's not all we have for today. Joining us uh, via Skype in just a few moments, we're going to be having Tim Walters joining us from Forrester Research. And then a little later on the show, we have Michael Alden from Acceler joining us in studio. He's actually, I see him behind the glass, so he'll be joining us in literally just a few moments, and that's coming around the bend, if you will. Before we begin, however, I'd like to say thank you and acknowledge our CMS Connected sponsors, really who make this entire thing come together. First off, as always, we've got Falcon Software. Now, Falcon provides web creative, e-commerce, content management, social media, and mobile solutions for organizations across the globe. And of course, we're also you know, signaling out Digital Clarity Group. DCG is a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. All right, so... With all of that being said and all of that out of the way, it's time to kind of dive into some of the top news stories and events from around the CMS industry. And to kick things off, we're going to be having a Salesforce in the news announcing that they're entering the WCM space. Now, Salesforce.com actually unveils the next generation of the social enterprise dramatically expanding with Salesforce Ripple and SalesforceSite.com. Now, according to Salesforce, Ripple enables companies to engage and align people across the employee social network, and SalesforceSite.com empowers marketers to deliver fresh content and consistent brand experience across public social networks. So, Scott, your thoughts? Good move by Salesforce? What do you think? I, I think it's a big move, and I think yeah. it's a bigger move than most give credit to it, right? You haven't, I mean, at least I feel like I'm pretty close to this industry, and I haven't seen a whole <laughs> lot about this, to be honest. I think, you know, when it first broke, but people kind of dismissed it and said, you know, good luck SharePoint, I mean, sorry, good luck, good luck Salesforce, <laughs> uh, you don't know what you're getting into. And, and while that may very well be true, um, you know, I talked about this the last time, um, I think a couple of times ago, that there's this notion of convergence, right, about, of, you know, integrations of a number of these big players as we move closer and closer to this notion of a you know, real-time interactive experience with your audience and this notion of CRM and, and, and WCM Talk coming together. Talk about that more though. Go into that because obviously you address the convergence part, but this is kind of the first time that we're really seeing these two dominant features really kind of work hand in hand with one another, the CRM and the CMS. It is, and that's why I think it's big, right? I mean, I think one of the predictions that I made back in, in, in January was <laughs> that... We should bring that clip up too to show <laughs> that you were right, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I wasn't exactly right because I predicted that... that uh, SAP, you know, we were talking about acquisitions, yes. yep. and I talked about SAP acquiring at that time. I predicted Core Media, but I think either way, this is nearly just as big because it's again kind of native CRM, a big player in this industry, in the CRM industry, huge. Both, by the way, with very large enterprises and with your smaller enterprises, right? And pulling together in this this web content management capability, I don't think it's as big as the SAP one that I was predicting because it didn't they didn't buy an existing player. We don't know if you know, site.com is going to live up to the standards of your typical web content management system, right? Um, it's not like they went out and acquired an existing uh, platform. But I do think it's still really big to see them enter it, to see that validity of these two things come together, and this notion of audience-centric content, everything being around your audience. I well, think it's really what does big. that mean for the industry now? Uh, obviously, with these guys, I mean, how does that really shift things? I think there's a couple, you know, this has a couple of implications. Number one, we've talked before, and we're going to talk again today about cloud players, right? Yep. Obviously, Salesforce.com is big in the cloud, and so once again, here's yet another entrant into the WCM market from the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think two is, uh, again, just this notion of CRM and WCM coming together. Everybody's talking about it. Who better to be able to make it happen than one of the big, you know, uh, CRM players? Um, I think that's really big. Um, and then three, kind of what of that information, they're also, um, you know, 
we've seen Salesforce.com make fairly decent strides in the social realm, yeah. right? And so I think it's, again, it's also this notion of social coming into that and that this notion of social CRM and that whole kind of graph about us, the social graph that we have about us being able to come be relevant and now suddenly for people to be able to start targeting content and from a WCM perspective with all of that in mind, um, as well as your interactions with that business, I think it's really big implications. Okay, big implications indeed, but you know, we do in fact have to kind of move on to our second news topic. Now obviously we're going to be talking now about Adobe. Now Adobe, interesting things really taking place with them across their entire brand, whether it be from the WCM perspective or my world, the creative. We saw a lot of different big announcements coming from them, but Adobe held its digital marketing summit in Salt Lake City just a few weeks back really, and they have actually had a bevy of announcements, including an upgrade to the digital marketing suite with shiny new predictive analytics. Now, when Adobe bought Omniture several years ago, Scott, they, they might have you know, not just known just how useful this product was going to be moving forward, or maybe they did see a future really where data was going to be mattering a lot more than ever, huh? There's no question that they saw it. Right? I think <laughs> we didn't all see, I think we all saw that data mattered, but I don't think that we all necessarily saw when Adobe first went out and bought Omniture. I was a little bit disappointed thinking, you know, what are they going to do with that product? And frankly, it kind of sat there for a little bit, right? But um, they've, I think very clearly now as we're seeing their strategy play out, they very much knew what they were doing. I think, you know, Omniture brought for Adobe the notion of getting them into the cloud, getting them into enterprise software in the first place, and certainly laying the groundwork for this, you know, the future, what's now the, the day acquisition, to be able to start to pull all this stuff together. I think this play only brings that, you know, even further. Some of these announcements, they talk about the notion of predictive analytics and what they're doing with the Omniture product and its ability to do that for them, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, Adobe Social, which we can talk about. Well, why did they kind of let it sit on the shelf a little bit? What was the reasoning for that? I mean, is it because the market wasn't just ready yet, or what? Look, I'm not in their in, in their boardroom, yeah. right? So I, I don't know all the ins and outs. Um, certainly, I think a lot of acquisitions too quickly, um, you know, it doesn't bode well for anybody. You've got a fair amount of integration that you've got to go back and do. You've got to figure out what you've got. Um, you've got to let it simmer for a while. But I, you know, I think. Uh, even if this if this was a part of their you know this wait and sit number one they might have been looking for the right play acquisitions take a while but um, I think you know in hindsight it was a great idea I think if anything we I've said this before that I think Adobe's acquisitions they've done a really good job at making sure they find the right product the right team pulling that team and using their expertise bringing them into that executive level suite just like you know uh, uh, for them so in the same way that with Adobe Day. Those folks, the core people from from Day, have been instrumental mm -hmm. in Adobe's strategy. So I think their acquisitions are doing right. So people should, you know, look to you know, maybe everybody should let them sit and wait for a little while. Well, one of the things I think is interesting with Adobe, I mean, nobody can make an entrance in a splash really like Adobe can. They they seem to have that flair when an announcement comes. Can they follow through though? In your mind, can they actually be able to say, "Hey, this is what we're doing," yeah. but now actually succeed? I think that this, you know, I was somewhat up until um, this point somewhat disappointed with what, um, how Adobe had integrated or not integrated yet Omniture into the suite. So they had done a fair, fairly decent job with, with Day and I liked where the CQ product was going, but we hadn't seen a whole lot of integration of, of Omniture. And I think with this now, they've really started to pull those together very well. Um, and I think that um, we see now this notion of predictive analytics, which by the way, I don't love that term. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's saying that I can look in the rearview mirror and then predict. I don't know that you can necessarily predict, but what you can do is lay the groundwork for but based you can on have an idea. You can, well, you can. I, I think the notion of prediction means here's what people are going to do. Instead, what, the way that I would like to think about it is um, looking at past data can help you make infer. I'd call it, uh, you know. Inferential rather yes. than predictive. Predictive. Inferential analytics, like kind of what can I infer about this person who's here based on folks who are similar to them and what they've done in the past, and how can I then lay the groundwork for that person to take certain actions that I'd like them to take action? Uh, I think it's just enabling the marketer uh, in this case to to do some of that stuff. So I, I, I like it. Yeah. Inferential. Inferential. I just said analytics. analytics. I like that. I like that, that term for sure. All right. Let, let's move on. Let's go and let's talk about Mplay because uh, they raised quite a chunk of dough as far as venture capital is concerned. 
necessary. You know, Mplay raises over $21 million in total venture capital and launches next generation content management, engagement, and their monetization platform. Now, this is a quote from their founder, uh, CEO, excuse me, founding chairman, CEO, and president of Mplay, uh, Dr. Christos Kotsakos. He says, today's legacy systems struggle to deliver and optimize content to tablets and smart devices in a functional format that the audience expects. Now, he went on to say, when companies fail to meet these expectations, their audiences disengage, go elsewhere, and the latest release of the Mplay platform addresses these and other key issues and sets a new business standard. Scott, what's your thoughts on that right there? We talked about it in play a few yeah, I was last say, we, month. We were there just ago. a couple months ago, right? It's starting to annoy me a little bit, to be honest really? with you. Yeah, this spear casting or stone casting from glass houses sort of thing. I think, you know, look, the whole the premise of this uh, of this announcement is that they raised twenty one million dollars in capital, or that they're now up to twenty five twenty one million dollars. They announced their release back in November at the Gilbane show. I know this. Yep. They were a big sponsor there. Now this is an announcement that the platform is actually ready, yet they've been casting these spears all along for the last six months. I agree with that full statement that, that, that you just showed up there, the infographic that talked about the implications of consumers and walking away, except for the last part, which is that Enplay is going to be able to change that whole realm. I mean, good luck. Let's see how it goes. But we've been talking about it for a long time. Did you raise money because you ran out of money because you're so late in your product coming out? I mean, you know, I, I, I There's a lot it. of things kind of behind closed doors that you'd have to see before you actually buy into it, basically. You know, look, the product itself, in terms of what it claims to be able to do and what I've seen from kind of demo where it'd be able to do, which, by the way, I've never seen it in a working environment okay. yet. I'm not saying that it's not out there. I'm saying I've not come across it. Um, is that you know you can do things like manage your content rather than just distributing to mobile that you can actually manage it from a mobile device. I think that's pretty uh, nice except that what is that one percent of the use cases so that's a big huge thing that they talk about but how, how many of us necessarily need to be able to go and publish from our from our mobile phone. It might be one of the you know use cases that increases but today you know. Well, I'm wondering from, from that perspective, you said how many people actually need to go out and do that. I, I, think, I think you're looking at a, a much lower level, right? I don't think we're looking at a lot of enterprise companies that are going to be publishing from the mobile. And therein lies the thing. I think they've got a three-tiered platform strategy where they've actually got what they call, uh, I think it's called N, N Play Plus, which is the only product that's, in, that's out right now, which is the kind of lowest level um, non-enterprise play. Then I think it's got you know enterprise. It's uh, sorry, N Play Pro, and then N Play Enterprise. Neither of those last two are out yet. So good luck when you actually get you know. So we're trying to have we have a company that's brand new that's not been out there doing a whole lot, raising a whole bunch of money, having multiple announcements um, that, that they're out and ready yet. Two thirds of their product stack is not ready. I don't know how you meet the needs of all those audiences, which are huge and varying, right? The needs of an enterprise audience, as well as the needs of kind of an individual blogger. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see any other very, uh, we don't see anybody else doing that necessarily very well. Um, we see some people trying, uh, but I haven't seen that very successfully yet. So good luck for a new product that has no history. I, I so what, uh, well, let challenge. me ask you this, kind of in closing, then, because you said off the top that you know we've continued to talk about them. Almost every CMS we connected, we, we we've, had, we've mentioned them somewhere or another. Almost annoying. You said now it's almost annoying. What do they have to do to get on your good graces? Show me something. Right? Yeah. I mean, let's see it. So we've heard about it a lot. I've been briefed on it a lot. I like the idea. I like what they talk. But then I was ready to see it out in the market a long time ago. It's just been kind of like, let's talk about it. Let's tell everybody that they're not, you know, disruptive enough. That they're not, you know, <laughs> that, that, that the old, actually he even called it, I think we use the term legacy to describe the other existing players that are out there as if they're so, you know, completely past tense. But we've not seen the product yet and we've not seen it in use. So all big talk, lots of big talk. It certainly might sell to investors who are going to give you that money. But let's see your product at the market. Let's see it do what it says. That's a couple of investors, 21 million. That's it a, chunk a few. Down. That's definitely for I'll sure. All right. well, let's move on. Let's go ahead and let's talk about what we said we were going to be talking about right at the top of the show, yeah. and that is SharePoint. So on f April 4th, excuse me, uh, Barb Mosier, managing editor and senior writer for CMSWire.com, wrote an article about Microsoft's vision for social and what that might mean for SharePoint based on a study conducted by Harris Interactive back in February of this year. Now, Harris surveyed 202 decision makers working at large-size organizations, and of those surveyed, 61% already deployed a social network, and 39% were in the process of developing one. Those are some pretty interesting facts, Scott, but you know, what were some of the other key findings that were uncovered from this survey in particular? Sure. 
I think, um, to be honest, this was, was perfectly supportive of where the direction that SharePoint was already heading in. What, what folks said, I think it was a response by 200 or so folks um, in, the, in their audience, about 50-50 um, IT versus line of business, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what they basically said is that the notion of kind of this social in the enterprise needs to be supportive of getting work done kind of, you know, productivity, essentially, is where they went. You know, that, that, that things like um, microblogging and being able to, you know, uh, other features like that, the kind of twitter is are less important to them than are things like collaboration. Um, and they also, you know, pointed out clearly that I think SharePoint's inference is, is clearly that something like email doesn't go away with the advance of this. That yeah. It's just all about rallying around how people get work done together in this notion of kind of pulling groups of people. Well, I think it goes back to also the idea that it's a tool. It's not necessarily the only piece. I don't think everybody's going to be moving away, like you said, moving away from e email, moving away from, you know, your white papers, but they're just going to be jumping on Twitter. That's not going to happen. It's right. just a tool inside the entire play, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. It's, it's, it's a tool, one of, a, one of a number of them, like you say, and that was one of the other big things that people stressed. And by the way, it was the more even, as Barb pointed out, it was more even from the um, non-IT folks from the line of business yeah. folks basically mentioned that integration with other internal apps already that are present um, is kind of the biggest key for them. That's, that's, that's a must-have, right? So that's one of the critical success factors is its ability to integrate with these other kind of tools that they're already using. Talk about the importance of that, though. I mean, the, the ability to integrate, because that's something that a lot are missing out on. I think that, you know, that's where um, SharePoint loved to see that, right? That's where the biggest response yeah. is. That they're all trying, they're basically, and we'll talk about this a lot later today. Exactly, we've got a lot of SharePoint. Is that there's a, you know, there's a lot within SharePoint. It's trying to be a lot of things to a lot of people. It's integrating as well some, you know, levels of the desktop applications along with the notion of enterprise content management, the notion of collaboration, the notion of all those sorts of things. So I think, you know, it's just more in support of SharePoint being the best platform for this. They also said that people didn't, in order to get uh, the notion of enterprise social and collaboration, they didn't want to go out and have to buy something new, right? So SharePoint is already in existence for many. So this was just completely trumpeting their existing strategy. I don't think that took them in any different direction. Okay, there. excellent. So, you know, one of the things we're going to do is we are going to, in fact, move on right now, but I want to move on and hit the next topic. And, you know, the word graveyard is what is going to be used right now. This is pretty interesting uh, right now, is which legacy CMS is the biggest content graveyard? Now, Lawrence Hart, uh, Chief uh, Technology Officer at AIM, wrote a post on his Word of Pi blog uh, about a debate he had with a Microsoft employee on Twitter. Now, they were arguing whether, you know, uh, Documentum or SharePoint was the biggest content graveyard. So, what, what's your take on this debate? And really, are, are legacy content management systems simply content graveyards in your mind? And that's pretty harsh. That's, those are very strong words. It's harsh. And I think you know, this whole thing, I think the, the most ironic about all of this is that this whole thing was based on somebody who tweeted, a friend of mine, Melissa Webster, tweeted a, a, a quote by somebody who was actually the GM um, of Lotus's e-commerce product. And the, the biggest ir irony of all this is that people are pulling off of Lotus products as quickly as they can. <laughs> but um, you know, the, the point was is that content, to, you know, content at rest is a cost versus content in motion is value. That was the gist of this whole discussion. That was the um, point that he made. Exactly. This, so there, there you see it. Um, and, so, and that quote was actually not Melissa's quote. It was, I think she was quoting this uh, mm -hmm. GM from, from Lotusphere. Um, the point here is that, you, yes, the answer is, are they content graveyards? Yes, in many cases. Okay. Is that, therefore, then a cost as opposed to value add? Yes, it is. Is that because of the technology, though, is the question that's, I think, the I was biggest say, What's debate. the reasoning is people are wanting to know more than anything? I think it comes back to this point that um, IT is constantly struggling to provide value back to the business, right? And their way to do that is, let us give you a tool. And if we don't have, we've beat this to death. We beat this to death with yeah. Lisa Welchman last month about if you don't have proper governance around it, if you don't have proper change management in place when you're implementing something, getting some real, you know, finding what are those use cases in your business, those stories in your business that you're going to help to be able to support with whatever this new tool is, getting some real uh, champions on board to be able to support uh, this new tool and whatever it is that you're launching. If you just put it out there, if you build it, they will come. If you have that mentality, then people will just either not use it at all 
or use it to their own devices, not necessarily the way that you intended. Okay, so what does that take? Because, I mean, can you speak from experience? Here at The Pulse, you know, we implemented yeah. a SharePoint as well. And one of the things that I found was interesting was that build it, they will come mentality. Yeah. And, you know, some folks dove right in. Other divisions are a little bit re reluctant. And it then becomes a strain on IT for them to be able to look at it and say, okay, well, now I have to go almost and feel like I have to train each individual person. And that becomes a problem, especially when your companies get larger and larger. The, the, the biggest thing that, um, you know, the SharePoint salespeople will be out there touting is that, you know, and by the way, not just SharePoint. I shouldn't say that it's SharePoint. But is, is the point that, you know, you can just you can just give this to your department heads, they'll put it out there and then let the sharing begin. Let the, <laughs> you know. Um, but in fact, what happens if you don't have these thoughts behind governance and change management and have, helping to direct people about how you're gonna use these things, then what you end up having is things, people, people just misuse it. And I think while, you know, content at rest is a cost and content in motion is valuable, um, I think duplicative content, mm -hmm. which is what ends up in a lot of cases with things like SharePoint, where people are just posting and reposting the same documents, which is what content management was there trying to solve in the first <laughs> From place. The beginning. It was about being able to use single source content and, and have it appear where it's appropriate. But what ends up happening is it becomes a big file share again and mm -hmm. again and again. And, and now it's webified and now you've got to support that and you've got the same document in many places. That's not only is that a cost, it's, it, it's degrading value of having it out there because now you've got to try, try to figure out how to manage that same document times four versions rather than one. So going back to the argument that uh, Pi, my friend Lawrence Hart, was having with yes. the person he was debating against, the question of which one is the bigger graveyard, I think you know, I'll agree with both of their takeaways that both SharePoint and Documentum or you know, replace Documentum with whatever you want um, fall into the same situation. It's not the product, right? It's about how it's being used, but I think that SharePoint T tends to be misused more because of its very low barrier to entry, right? People think the CIO says, oh, we've got SharePoint on the shelf, like, let's just get it out there, let's just put it out. So you don't have to have this big, huge cost of a documentum implementation, a gazillion consultants coming in. So you pay less attention to some of those kind of non-techy things like governance and change management, yeah. and you just kind of let it get out there and simmer and it gets misused, and that's, that's where problems start, I think. Fair enough. All right, let's move on. Let's get some more opinions, really not necessarily on just this topic alone, but more along SharePoint. Joining us on CMS Connected via Skype right now is uh, uh, Tim Walters, PhD, a senior analyst at Forrester Research. Uh, Tim, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks very much, Tyler. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, Tim, let's kind of dive right in uh, with a look at where SharePoint WCM aligns in the marketplace, if you will. You know, from a web content management perspective, what are its strengths, you know, its weaknesses, and how does it really stack up against some of the other top WCM and .NET yeah. uh, solutions? Okay, so that, that is no doubt a really important question and it's one that an increasing number of, of organizations and, and people are, are posing for themselves and for their organization simply because the, the usage of SharePoint is spreading. But I think that before you can really go in and talk about feature-feature comparisons uh, around SharePoint and WCM, you need to take a step back and look at SharePoint as a whole. So Scott mentioned a few minutes ago that this is a big platform. You also just flashed for a second the, uh, a, a screenshot from SharePoint that has this kind of blue circle uh, with, a, with a, like a pie chart in it. And, and that helps define what SharePoint actually is. It's a very broad and a very sophisticated platform. And in fact, the breadth and the relative the relatively strong integration of workloads across that platform is one of SharePoint's main attractions. So Microsoft talks about these six main areas. They call communities, content, search, insights, composites, and sites. So in, in more traditional terms, that means that SharePoint is or supports collaboration and social, as you guys were talking about, content storage and sh sharing, so ECM, document management, to some extent records management, enterprise search, business intelligence, custom application development, and with SharePoint 2010, an actually pretty solid application development platform, portal functionality for aggregation and presentation, as in web parts as they call them, portlets, and then finally, of course, WCM as well, most often for intranets, but also conceivably for customer-facing sites. So as one of our Forrester reports says, it's like the old Saturday Night Live uh, skit, SharePoint is a floor wax and a dessert topping. 
Thanks, Simon. Welcome to the show, by the way. Really psyched to have you on. Hey, uh, Scott. So, so let's, um, so SharePoint is a lot of things to a lot of people. I said that, you echoed that. I think you put that really eloquently. Can we talk about it from the perspective of uh, web content management? Because we're, we're um, going to talk about it from a few angles today. But let's yep. focus quickly on the web content management. Yeah. Um, I'm asked a lot of times to compare SharePoint's web content management capabilities to those of the other WCM players that are out there. Um, yep. Is that an appropriate comparison? It is, but there's one other factor that I want to make sure that we mentioned. So, and that is that SharePoint certainly has WCM capabilities. It can be used as a WCM. There's no doubt about that, right? It, it often is used as that. But precisely because of this breadth and size and complexity and, and cost, usually, it would be bizarre or if not outright crazy to evaluate <laughs> SharePoint solely as a WCM solution. And, you know, personally, I've never heard in, in my, my years at Forrester, in all of my conversations with clients, I've personally never heard of a situation where SharePoint was evaluated and selected and implemented only in order to run websites. Mm -hmm. okay? So when an organization includes SharePoint on a list of, of potential .NET, or not only .NET, other kinds of WCM solutions, it, it must be because they already own it, they're using it for other stuff, or they are anticipating owning it, and they want to know whether the WCM workload can also be deployed to achieve their goals um, you know, for the customer-facing websites. And that's smart. That's entirely advisable. You owe it to yourself in those situations to investigate whether SharePoint can serve your needs. But you cannot make the mistake, and some organizations do, of thinking that just because you own it, you should use it. And so I, I think you are spot on with, I think, where the circumstances are that I see it being put in is, you know, usually that there's some mandate that the CIO says, we need to make sure that we're taking a, a look at SharePoint as a part of this, uh, you know, search strategy. Um, sorry, the selection strategy, at, at search for, yeah, via evaluation. That, though, means to me that there's some assumption that um, using it for which you say it doesn't stack up individually well against will help to, I don't know what, deliver on the initial ROI of the, of the overall yeah. purpose? Do you think that's a sound strategy? Does well, that make sense? It, it's not necessarily a sound strategy, but you can see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are kind of two typical um, financial incentives here. Uh, and, and very often I'll have conversations with people who are saying, you know, either... I, you know, I, who are saying, first of all, A, I've been told by a boss, right, the CFO or the CIO or my manager or whatever, that we need to, we need to use SharePoint for external sites. Help me understand what this is going to mean and where are the limitations. Or in some cases, they'll call and say, I've been told to use SharePoint for external sites. How can I avoid that? <laughs> How can I escape from that? So the, the financial incentives are either somebody thinks we already own it, so it's free, so let's just use it. <laughs> and that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. okay? I mean, open source isn't free either. And secondly, what are you going to have to do to SharePoint in terms of customization to get it to do what you may want it to do? Maybe nothing if your needs are, are simple enough. And the second slightly more rational one is, as you were saying, we already own SharePoint. It's not the cheapest thing that we've ever invested in. We need to deploy more of its workloads in order to get the maximum amount of, amount of value out of our investment. Okay. So that's, that can push teams in the direction of using it for external facing websites. And, and I don't mean to sound down on it, although my questions do sound <laughs> like I am. <laughs> I'm not, but th there's another notion, and I think others uh, maybe in the Real Story group have put out numbers that say that in their study of their customers, uh, something like, you know, where the average uh, CMS WCM implementation, the services to product licensing ratio is something like a three to one or a four to one, mm -hmm. that in their experience, the SharePoint, uh, you know, relative ratio is something more like eight to 10 to one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Does that jive with what you're saying? And wouldn't that then therefore mean that kind of you're actually degrading your ROI, aren't you, if that's true? Ah, well, that's that's quite possible. So I don't I don't have those kinds of metrics in mind. I don't track that kind of thing. But you could imagine where that would be coming from. I mean, I could see how that could possibly be backed up by by reality. First of all, 
it definitely would degrade your ROI and trying to get more value out of SharePoint. And that's precisely why in the evaluation process, you need to be not just comparing, you know, function functionality of, of vendors A, B, and C. You need to determine, you know, as I always say, do a scenario-based evaluation, determine exactly what your current and, and, and predictable future business needs are going to be, and test to those requirements. Yeah. And then very carefully measure the delta between each one of the vendors, uh, vendor solutions that you're considering and, and where you want to be. And what's it going to take you to get to where you need to be based upon each one of those platforms? And more important, not more importantly, equally important, what's it going to take to maintain uh, that, you know, to, to feed and nurture for that solution built upon one, one or other of the, of the vendor solutions? So, Tim, we've just got one minute left. I want to just ask you uh, one last question then is kind of, Okay, so if we say that it doesn't necessarily stack up one to one, yeah. but we say it's smart to take a look into it, and there certainly are some places where, and certainly folks are using it. I mean, they're out yeah. there talking about Ferrari.com is yeah. built on, you know, SharePoint, and if you go look at that, that looks yeah. like a pretty nice site. Who is it appropriate for? Tell me some of the scenarios yeah. in which SharePoint as a web content management system yeah. would be appropriate. Okay, let me know when I have to stop. Um, <laughs> about forty uh, seconds. You know, so so. Yet, one, you can build anything you possibly want on SharePoint, given enough time, effort, and money. Secondly, Ferrari.com is a really great-looking site. Now, I think there are two possible scenarios. Now, take a look at Ferrari.com and take a look at SharePoint out of the box. Something happened <laughs> between those two uh, that was very significant. Either there's a tremendous amount of customization in, in SharePoint.com, and it's not a best practice approach. Or it's also possible, and I'm just not technically astute to figure this out, that it's basically one giant um, silver light movie, right? <laughs> um, and, okay, so in answer to your question, what scenarios are best? Basically, the simpler the scenario, the better. Right off the top, you can say, whatever SharePoint is as a WCM, it is not a CXM. It doesn't offer some of those extended CXM features that you see from other vendors in the .NET space like Sitecore and EpiServer, for example. It's not going in that direction at all. So if you want segmentation, targeting, behavior-based personalization, marketing campaign management, real-time analytics, you're not getting any of that from SharePoint. Secondly, as a WCM, so for running websites only, not multi-channel campaigns, not heavy marketing requirements, then it's still got some limitations. For example, it still doesn't have, kind of shockingly enough, complete separation of content and presentation. Right? We wanted to have that done some years ago. The folder-based storage complicates content reuse across sites or even across parts of a site. It doesn't have in-context editing, which most WCM vendors now have, now have. It has quite poor management or support for managing multilingual content and multilingual sites. So in some of those areas, even if, you've, even if you've, you're not interested in customer experience management, but just WCM for running websites, there's still some limitations with the current version of SharePoint. Excellent. Tim, honestly, th thank you so much for taking time out, jumping on the show. Let's really appreciate it. I know it seems like always, Scott, we, we could go on for an entire Absolutely. show just on that uh, one topic in particular. <laughs> Tim, honestly, thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Excellent. That right there, Tim Walters, Senior Analyst at Forrester Research. Now, we are going to take a quick break, but when we return from that break, we're going to have Michael Older from Acceler. He's going to be uh, joining us to help analyze SharePoint and governance. Now, this is something that we've talked about in length. And finally, after that, we're going to be having in the spotlight as well as rapid fire segments with Scott Lewis. So don't go anywhere. You're watching CMS Connected here on the Pulse Network. Customers are demanding more from their web experience. And as web experiences become more complex, CMOs are demanding more from their digital marketing channels. So at Ektron, we looked at our web content management platform from a comprehensive perspective, and we asked ourselves, how can we help you connect content with context, reach customers across channels, and drive business results? We started by revolutionizing web content management. Our content authoring tools are so intuitive. You can publish everything from simple updates through entire campaigns without relying on developers. Templates and workflow ensure that content is brand compliant and published only when it's ready. Speed to web is just the beginning. 
you need to engage, convert, and retain your customers. When you combine what you already know about them with their behavior, you can target every visitor with truly personalized content. Ektron also prepares you to deliver a multi-channel experience because we can separate content from how it's presented. You're poised for maximum multi-channel success. Web, print, mobile, social networks, and whatever's next on the horizon. Of course you need meaningful ways to measure and optimize. Ektron in-context analytics help you interpret results by bringing best in-class solutions into your CMS. And with multivariate testing, you can triple conversion rates by experimenting with content, copy, and layout. At Ektron, we take pride in delivering the most advanced web content management platform. It's scalable, it's flexible, and it's easy to integrate with your existing technology investments. That's why many of the world's largest companies choose Ektron. They rely on us to help them drive the business results that matter to them. And we could do the same for your company. All right, everyone, welcome back into CMS Connected here on the Pulse Network. I am Tyler Pybert. Now joining us on CMS Connected is Michael Allen, President and CEO of Accela. Michael, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Tyler. Excellent. Thank th thanks for taking time out of the day. I know, obviously, you guys actually aren't too far away from us here at nope. the Pulse, but right up the appreciate street. you taking time out. Happy to. So thanks now, for me. Accela has been involved in a lot of different articles and surveys of late on why companies are, you know, not coming to grips, if you will, you know, with SharePoint governance. Kind of elaborate on that a little bit for our audience, if you could. Sure. Well, SharePoint is a uh, dominant platform out there for content management, enterprise content management in the marketplace. And it grew very, very rapidly over the past couple of years, mostly as the Wild West. It wasn't very controlled. It wasn't governed. And so what you're left with is a huge marketplace out there and organizations that are looking to put finer control and finer governance into their uh, SharePoint systems. Um, with the advent of 2010, uh, people upgrading to the latest version. What we're seeing is that everybody is deploying 2010 with governance in mind. We're not going to do what we did previously. We're going to do it right <laughs> this time. And so we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, impetus around that. There's a, uh, a big, big marketplace out there. There's 65,000 uh, customers out there that uh, have deployed SharePoint. So we're hearing more and more of this, um, which is why we decided to do our survey and for ourselves get a handle on what's happening in the marketplace and really is what's reality, what are the perceptions that's happening out there for governance. Hmm. Interesting. I was going to say, Scott, I know you had a, definitely were looking at this, and we talked about governance uh, just a week, uh, excuse me, a month ago. This is the exact same idea. We did. We spent a fair amount of time on that, and I think certainly, um, as I said then, too, uh, that SharePoint sometimes gets a bad reputation for some of the its use or misuse, and usually that has to do less, again, with the product and more around the, the governance, you know, around processes that are related to it and documents that are related to it. In your study, which, by the way, was really interesting that you guys went and did this. I mean, we don't know each other. I went out and found you because of that study, and yep. I think this was, it was great stuff. It brings to light the notion, though, that of your respondents, pretty much all of them agree fully that government governance is necessary, and it's a big on their agenda, yep. yet it shows that many of them haven't gone and implemented Over it. Half. Why the Yeah, why yeah the so gap? I think it's 70 percent believe it's important. Uh, the majority haven't done anything and most think it's urgent to address. So sure. it's a really, really good marketplace to be into. Sure. I think that it's the growth of SharePoint really that has put us here. For a while, it was SharePoint's the answer, what's your question? Mm -hmm. And so there was no alignment between why are we deploying SharePoint and what are we going to get out of it? Sure. And governance really is about aligning uh, SharePoint with business results and business expectations, rules and policies around what can be done, whether it's infrastructure or whether it's content. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing that really uh, come up and be a massive part of, uh, of what we're talking to customers about today. We have 2,500 customers over 42 countries, and we hear it consistently across all of them that this is a big, big need. This is an issue. And so, so I, I guess what's the, what's the ways that they're starting to try to bridge that gap? What are the things that folks are doing now that they're trying to get it right the second time around when they're upgrading? What are some of, is, it, is it all about practice? Is it about taking advantages of new capabilities of 2010, yep. where, you know, where do you bridge that gap? You mentioned a piece of it earlier, which is really making sure there's a champion and there's uh, executive buy-in and executive alignment in terms of why we're deploying the, the sure. product and making sure there's an understanding you know, a year into the implementation or two years, has it, su has it succeeded or has it failed? Mm -hmm. And so it's really about defining what are we using it for, re you know, reining in the expectation that it's everything to everybody, yep. focusing on really what matters and making sure you run it like a project, sure. right? Whether it's um, 
you know, change management, which you talked about earlier, or understanding what content you have in SharePoint or what's happening on an infrastructure basis. Mm -hmm. All of those things are really important. So at the end of the day, you have a much greater return on investment from running SharePoint. You know, your business users are happier, IT is happier, and uh, you've got a much happier customer base. Sure. And is that then, um, in terms of advising folks about that and helping to institute some of those practices, yes. is that where the integrators fit in? Or who is the person? Is it, is it an internal SharePoint advocate that you have to build a, uh, you know, what do you call that, a center of excellence around yep. this? Or what's the approach? Yep. yep. So typically there is uh, an internal um, a governance task force or some types of governance uh, center of excellence. There's a lot happening in the community in terms of best practices, in terms of what does it actually mean to have a well-governed SharePoint environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran, uh, ran the survey as a way to understand where the market's at. The next part of the survey that we're doing is understanding roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. inside of SharePoint, sure. which is building out a governance team, what types of people do you need. Sure. So we'll be posting those results again and trying really to be part of helping define this governance process for SharePoint. Sure. Now. I should take a step back and say, why don't you introduce us to who Acceler is? Because sure. you helped to bridge some of that gap. And yep. I think you do it not only from the standpoint of systems integration and helping to be that, that uh, army of people, but I think you also have some products. And is there a, is there a technology play in here to help fill some of this sure. need as, as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Yeah, of course there is. So from our perspective, Acceler is um, a Microsoft Gold partner. We're an ISV. We're based uh, here in Woburn, but we have offices globally. Um, our business from a uh, governance perspective is really helping with the management of SharePoint mm -hmm. and the enforcement of governance policies across multiple SharePoint farms. Okay. So we allow an organization, and what we're seeing today out there is that most companies are running 2007, 2010, and they're starting to run SharePoint online. Gotcha. So we allow them from a single pane of glass to look at their entire environment, manage their systems, and enforce governance policies across all of those. So you know, whether it's you know, what, what content's out there, what, who has access to what pieces of content, uh, storage, you know, things like that. We will allow people to run reports and enforce what can be done and what can't be done according to their governance sure. policies. We talked earlier about this notion of the content graveyard. Yep. I hope you heard us oh, talking yes. about that. <clears throat> If folks feel like they've got a content graveyard, that it, like, are they past the point of no return? What do you do when you're actually sitting on whether it's a 2007 or a 2000, whatever implementation of the software? Does, at some point, yep. you've got a ton of stuff out there that is just a cost right now. Mm -hmm. how, do you, uh, how do you turn that ship around? So for older, I think if someone has 2007 and they're upgrading, they'll need to take a look at what, you know, what content they actually have and what's being used. Yep. So you'll need to look at what sites have actually been touched and what haven't been touched, what documents are the most active, what documents haven't been touched. Yep. Uh, we have products that will help with all of those things. And then in, in the migration, you migrate really what matters to the new system. You put effective governance in place in the new system, and then you move forward with a much more aligned. Um, so there is a road. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there is, is a, a way out of, yes. all, of all this stuff. Yep. How about the conversation that I just had with Tim? Were you able to hear some of that where we talked about SharePoint not as an enterprise content management yep. system or a document management system, but how about its play as a web content management system? What's your take on that? Sure. As well, I think just some real some data we got from our survey. We asked what, what are these organizations actually using SharePoint for, and I believe we had about 15% of them came back and said they were using it for web content management. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, in the conversations I have with customers and talking to our sales teams who spend a lot of time talking to customers, uh, it seems like it's a growing part of what uh, people are considering to do with SharePoint, but it doesn't yeah. seem to be the primary thing that people are doing with SharePoint. I think there's lots of, you know, we talked about the partner community. I believe at last uh, check it was about 3,000 partners mm -hmm. for SharePoint alone. So it's a massive community. There's systems integrators, as you've talked about, and there's uh, ISVs, software companies like ourselves that do management tools, dev tools, apps. Um, so I think there's just a, a massive spectrum of, of those types of products. There are several vendors that focus on building web content management on top of SharePoint, and then there's a lot of others, of course, that uh, integrate with it. Excellent. Really Michael, honestly, stuff. great stuff. Appreciate you coming thank by, you. really. No thank problem. you so much. I told you the time goes by too quick. It does? It? <laughs> I was going to say, 10 minutes. Yeah. Isn't it enough, folks? It, de it definitely yeah. is. It. Excellent stuff. That right there, Michael Allen, President and CEO of Acceler. Excellent stuff. Absolutely love to have him in studio and love to see exactly what is taking place. Now, obviously, that is going to basically almost conclude what we're going to be talking about and discussing as far as SharePoint is concerned with today. But you know what? We do, in fact, have to go ahead and move on. And we're going to be moving on to In the Spotlight.
Spotlight, and we're going to be talking about in the Spotlight this week, happens to be Sitefinity. Now, back in March of this year, Sitefinity released version 5 with new features such as mobile web-based responsive design, new formulas module, uh, new Thunder plugin for Visual Studio. I'm, I have to read off the list because there's so many of them. Uh, State-of-the-art module builder, Windows authentication uh, support, single sign-on list. It just goes on and on and on and on. Scott, what do you think of uh, Siphonity's latest release? I mean, does it really measure up? How does it measure up with so many integral parts? I think one of the nice things about the notion you talk about about measuring up, um, it's measuring up to who, measuring up to what. I think one of the really nice things that I like, so the first answer is yes, I like the product. Okay. But, but, but let me talk about Sitefinity first from the standpoint of its strategy. I really like that they know who they are. They know their customer base. They're not trying to move up into the larger enterprises as so many of the web content management systems that are kind of on the, tend to be on the lower and smaller enterprise market are all trying to do. They're all trying to swim upstream. I think Sitefinity nicely knows who they are, know who their audience is, and they're putting things in place to help cater to their needs specifically. They under, understand. So they're not solving the big fish problems or solving the medium size and smaller fish problems, and they're quite content to do that. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't stack up against any of the larger ones. They have a lot of, you know, on paper, the feature functions look very similar, but when you delve into it, it's definitely looking at the kind of the lower end needs. What I like, Tyler, about uh, version 5 is, you know, we've talked about this before, this notion about mobilization, and I think that should be one of the themes for a future, uh, for, for a future uh, CMS Connected. Um, <laughs> This notion of responsive design is extremely important, and I think they have really done a nice job. Um, it's got some things to be desired, and I'll touch on that, but it's some, they've done a really nice job enabling the non-tech savvy user to be able to go and figure out what parts of their website would they like to see show up where. Responsive design, I should remind you, is the ability to essentially, as you shrink a screen or as you sink, shrink the size of the device, that it starts to cater more and more to having smaller amounts of information on that screen. And what it typically does is it's going to accentuate those things which are priorities for that, for that inter interaction. So well, the, the, this goes back to what we, I mean, obviously we had talked before about, you know, publishing. Yeah. From before. But everybody's on mobile right now. I mean, that's what it all is. So it has to be. That's one of the most important things right now because so many different pieces of content is displayed on so many different types of screens. When we were talking about mobile before we, and publishing, we were talking about Endplay's notion that exactly. the publisher, the content manager themselves, exactly. needs to, be able to do that from a mobile device. I'm less sold on that, although I see it, yeah. um, than I am that your audience is on mobile. And this notion of responsive design has the audience in mind, that it's going to change the screen but and the layout of the, the content. So that's the important part of it all. It's all about the audience, right? So th that, that, is who you're, that is who it is. You know, where I think Sitefinity, excuse me, 5 leaves some things to be desired um, are, for example, they're just coming out of the gate on this responsive design notion. It's got this nice ability for a person to decide what's the layout. If you have three columns on a w larger website and you shift down to a mobile device, where does that third column move in order, sort of thing like that. You can do that switching out. What it doesn't allow for, there exactly on the screen, what it doesn't allow for is for you decide, to decide what you won't see at all. Right? And what I think is one of the biggest advantages of, of kind of the notion of mobilization is that we have to think of our audience's context, that when I come to your site from my mobile device, I'm looking to do different things uh, than I am when I'm on my computer, for example. And so there might be some information that I should also just completely not see, get rid of. It's not relevant to me in that context, right? And so it doesn't allow for that. So there's some lackings, and I'm sure 5.1 and whatever will address that, especially now that I've pointed out to all of you. Um, <laughs> but I think they've to, taken a really nice step. They've also done some things uh, um, with like their forums modules you mentioned. Um, so I, I think they've done some really nice stuff. Also setting themselves up to be more of a development environment. Some things that the developers out there, the IT, the geeks, as a term of endearment out in the, in the audience would like to see. Excellent. Cool stuff. All right, there you go. That's in the spotlight with Sitefinity. But we do, in fact, have our very last piece. It's time for some rapid fire. Absolutely. Finally, we come to the rapid fire segment with Scott. And this is kind of news and events from around the CMS industry. We basically put a minute on the clock. Let's see exactly how fast Scott can talk and try to get all his thoughts into one piece. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with 30 million downloads. We're going to be starting open source right now. 30 million Joomla downloads and another half a million for uh, LifeRay announced last month. What's going on in the open source marketplace with all these downloads at this point? 
I don't think anything new is going on necessarily. I just think there's some really nice milestones being hit by some, you know, Joomla is, uh, is very large in the open source world. Uh, you know, Drupal hit that milestone a while ago, uh, or, or sorry, WordPress hit that milestone a long time ago. So we're seeing the same thing that we've always seen. Open source is here, it's not going away. In my opinion though, the question is, who is doing that downloading and who's the audience that's doing that? I think they're all trying to make this play that they're talking about it being enterprise oriented and I don't know that we're necessarily seeing a large increase on the enterprise side. That's not a good or a bad thing. I'm not necessarily making a judgment. It's, it's they who are saying we don't want to just cater to the bloggers anymore and to the small businesses anymore. It's they who are saying we want to cater to the large enterprises that have these big processes in place. And certainly the communities are working towards that. I just don't know that when you've got an open source mindset that all the community members, if they're not in the enterprise already, you're going to be slower on the innovation at that level. All right, you got it in there. I dig it. All right, so let's go to, let's move on. Let's talk about CMS Wire's Tweet Jam. Now, CMS Wire's April Dam Tweet Jam took place on April 18th. Uh, Scott, kind of give me your takeaways from the Tweet Jam. I think it was nice. I, I've said before, I think I've used the quote uh, and cover your children's ears uh, that Tweet Jam suck. But um, <laughs> I, I just think that sometimes Twitter is just this like, oh, you're just receiving so much information so quickly that it's nice to be able to go back after the fact and uh, take a breather and look through it. They asked some really nice questions, things like how do you define digital asset management? Things like what are some of its uh, implications? How is it evolving? How does it support the notion of a CXM or what? I call CEM strategy, customer experience management strategy, and how critical is it to that? Um, I think all tended to agree that digital asset management has been around for a while, and it is still what it always was, which is a way to manage media assets more wisely. I think, though, everyone is starting to catch up to the fact that video is here, you need to have ways to make it findable, reusable, social, all those sorts of things. And so digital asset management is definitely critical to the CXM strategy and many are taking it on and adopting it. All right, let's move on to WEMI and the, the, the WEMI kickoff. I know you guys saw the next item on the list. Uh, it yields little. Now they seem right now, Scott, to be almost looking for a problem to solve. Do, do you agree with that? I think you're right. Um, you know, I, I, we talked about WEMI and we said that we we're going to keep you updated on the WEMI standards and WEMI to remind you again is the uh, notion of the uh, web experience management and interactive standards and, and um, by OASIS. And the group met in, uh, in Copenhagen. There was a joke that was made that if somebody were to have blown up that room, the entire CMS industry would have been flatlined and I agree with that. There was a lot of power hitters there. But it was somewhat underwhelming results where and it seemed like they were kind of spinning around on topics and I wasn't there. But it seemed to me that they were all talking about what could this be? How could it work? I think all agree, myself included, that the notion of WEMI, the ability to have these systems be able to integrate and interact and pass information through and fro uh, much more seamlessly and easily is very critical. Um, and it's definitely where everyone is going. And standardizing that is really helpful. I think, though, like you say, Tyler, they're just looking for that use case to help them out. I don't think they really came up with a whole lot um, as far as that goes. But we'll definitely look for more information from them. All right, let's go ahead and let's move on to Vasant. Actually, on April 3rd, Vasant Systems announced the addition of Synchrosoft's uh, popular tool, Oxygen, uh, to its arsenal of extensions to provide easy desktop web-based XML editing uh, with component content management. So Scott, you know, your thoughts, good move? Bad move? What do you make of it? Yeah, I think uh, I think a very good mood, uh, move. Um, you know, Vasant. Not everybody of, you know who's a fan of the show might necessarily be followers, but they're a, essentially a component content management system, which means that we're talking here about technical publishing, um, where you've got documents um, are the substance of it, and it's all about the you know, it's in bits and parts of that. So if you're talking about technical publications and things, being able to reuse that content, um, you know, translate it, all those sorts of things at that, at that lowest level. Um, I think the notion of being able to have that, you know, XML editor, which is, you know, Oxygen has a very nice platform in there, to be able to pull those two things together that you can now collaborate when, we're, when you're talking about creating and pulling together technical documents um, and to be able to use an XML editor that's certainly as easy to use as Oxygen is, that's only going to be helpful. And we're to see, you know, I think what we're seeing in the macro world of larger pieces of content being reused, I think you're also definitely seeing on the kind of smaller within a document standpoint being able to be reused, and that's only going to continue to advance. All right, a little bit earlier in the show, we talked about uh, social, we talked about the enterprise. L let's move on, let's take a look at Yammer, because uh, Yammer recently acquired OneDrum. Uh, what does that mean for the intersection, really, of social within the enterprise? Yeah. 
And, I, you know, so Yammer, let's again set the stage. Yammer is about kind of uh, enterprise social here and an enterprise social play, while OneDrub is about kind of document collaboration and things. I think what we're seeing here is the same place where we talked about SharePoint wants to go. Um, I think this is even much more relevant news because Yammer is a pretty big, pretty big player in this industry. And for them to be able to sp start to pull together the ideas of social and, you know, document collaboration and document creation, pulling those two things together has some pretty sizable implications. To be able to, within a Word document, um, I think what it is, we're actually seeing it go where Google went with their, um, um, you know, their platform where you can start to actually see some of the changes in line within a document that your collaborators are making in, in terms of Google Docs. Um, that sort of thing is now coming into the enterprise in terms of these desktop applications. So actually I think this is pretty big news and frankly bigger news than SharePoint was because I don't think anybody's following SharePoint in terms of being bleeding edge with their three year release cycle. So this is pretty big. All right, let's go ahead and let's wrap things up with a, a pretty interesting statistic and we'll talk about enterprise CMS failures right now. Now according to Forrester Research, uh, U.S. information management sector sees 66% of all projects fail largely as a result of poorly defined processes and communications. Now, this pattern sees to, it seems to be even more extremely uh, more extreme when it comes to enterprise CMS projects as well. So, was, I think that this begs the question: Why? Why is that? Look, uh, I think because those of us who are technologists have always underestimated the impact of non-technology. We, we look to technology first. As a matter of fact, those who are not technologists tend to overplay the technology and look to it first. I see this all the time when people are asking for, hey, I've got all these problems. I just need a new web content management system or fill that space with whatever it is that you want. We overemphasize technology and underemphasize the supporting processes people involvement, change management, governance. We've stressed this show after show. Um, so I think to put some numbers to this, where Forrester went out and said that nearly 70% of all these things fail, um, certainly there's some technology involved in that. But I think the failure is, number one, you have to first be able to decide what is failure and therefore what is success. Why are you doing this in the first place? If you don't have good reasons for going out and a good strategy, then you can't have the metrics to determine that. And so I think that's first and foremost. So I think this is just what we've already known. Okay, so you know we've got a couple seconds left to spare. So can you give me your closing thoughts? I mean, that was great rapid fire. You were spot on with it. Yeah, a couple Bust seconds. Out. Well, yeah, and the last one, I went over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it happens from time to time. But it kind of give me your closing thoughts, really taking today's show and wrapping it up for us. Sure. You know, I, I think as we've said, if we're going to talk about, um, we talked at the top of the show about new entrants into the world. There are still, you know, this from an economy standpoint, this part of the economy is mm -hmm. still booming, right? We see new entrants into the market, new, new, new money being flooded into the market to support that new acquisition, so there's still continued innovation, um, but I think what we're also seeing, as we heard stressed by both Tim and Mike, our guests, um, is that people are trying to figure this whole thing out. How to use it, how to govern it, how to make it happen to avoid the last debt that we put up there being a part of that 66% yeah, that don't end up you know, realizing what it is that they think they're getting. I was going to say, that's probably the, the, one of the most important stats to kind of remember and keep in the back of your mind. And we'll wrap the show with it. Perfect. So, Scott, good stuff today. Appreciate, appreciate you coming by. Thanks so much. Always. He's here every single month. I love it. Excellent stuff. So for my co-host, uh, Scott Lewer, I am Tyler Piper of the Pulse Network. For uh, all of our guests, Tim Walters and Michael Alden, uh, great stuff indeed. But before we go, I actually have to thank both of our sponsors, Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group, DCG. Uh, that's going to do it for us today here on CMS Connected. But join us again next month for another great show of CMS Connected right here on the Pulse Network.